Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing really, really well. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Heather and I'm a professional viola player living and working in the UK. And my channel is all about busting some industry myths, having a little bit of encouragement in an industry that can so often lean towards the negative side of things. And just a little bit of a safe space where we can actually chat about things and I will always be as candid and honest as I possibly can be and I hope that that is really helpful to you. So if you are somebody, maybe you've just started music college, maybe you're thinking of heading off to music college, maybe you graduated in the summer and you're like, ah, I've graduated into a world of madness, which to be fair, I mean, I props to you because anybody who graduated this year, that's insane. But anyway, off topic, Today is going to be a little bit of a back to basics kind of a video. So if you are somebody who has just started learning a string instrument, congratulations, you are in for a world of fun. No, seriously, really, really well done to you. Learning a string instrument is not easy, but there are so many things that we can do to make it easier on ourselves. And one of those things is just looking after your instrument correctly. Acoustic string instruments are made out of wood, so they are literally made out of a kind of living material and that means that we do have to treat them with a lot of care, with a lot of respect and it really really is absolutely vital to the longevity of your instrument, to it sounding good, to you enjoying playing it, the whole shebang. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now I am primarily a viola and violin player but you can apply any of these principles to cellos and double basses as well so if you're playing those instruments don't just kind of think this doesn't apply to you because yeah it's all fairly general stuff. Okay so first thing first the instrument itself. So when you first get your instrument it will come to you pretty much bare bones with the strings on, your pegs, and then you'll have your fine tuners. Now, some violas do not have all the fine tuners on, most violins do. Mine does, just because I actually have a little bit of a wolf note, which is where you get this kind of whistling sound, and the fine tuners actually stop it. So that's the reason that I have my fine tuners on, and also they make life easier. Some people get snobby about it, whatever. Anyway, the first thing to think about when it comes to your instrument is the temperature at which you are storing it. Like I said before, this is made out of wood. It will change, it will shrink, it will expand with heat and cold. So whatever you do, do not leave this in the boot of the car. <laughs> On a hot day, not good. On a cold day, really not good. So if you are traveling anywhere and it is possible to have it in the back seat, just like tuck it down in the footwell so it's nice and safe and secure, have it in there rather than putting it in the boot. Obviously that's not always possible, short journeys, doesn't really matter, but never store it in the boot of your car. Also think about where you're placing it in the house. Don't put your case right next to the radiator in the middle of winter because that radiator is going to go on, your instrument's going to get hot and it is going to damage it. These things can crack incredibly easily so just yeah, don't put it next to the radiator, don't leave it in the boot of your car and don't leave it on any window sills either. A little bit less of an issue if you are viola, cello or bass player because if you can fit that thing on your window sill, fair, fair play. But especially with the violin, don't leave it out on the windowsill and especially not when it's not in its case. Another thing when it comes to where to leave it, never put your viola or violin, cello, double bass, down on a chair or the bed or a sofa and walk away from it. You will forget it's there. <laughs> Other people will not notice that it's there and it will get sat on. So never leave it unattended really at all, but especially don't leave it on a chair or anywhere that it could be sat on, stood on, chewed by the dog. You get what I mean. Little, little side note, genuinely one of my most traumatic childhood memories is when I'd been playing my violin, I'd put it down on a chair and went into the other room and then my brothers thought it would be funny to run in and tell me that the dog had eaten my violin and had chewed it and I just utter complete cue meltdown. I think they felt a little bit bad about it afterwards so uh, yes but it definitely taught me my lesson I can, I can tell you that much. The next thing is just keeping it clean. Wash your hands every time before you play. Really, really important. Our fingers have a lot of just grease and oils on them naturally, and then as you go about your day, 
that kind of gets even worse. So make sure that you're washing your hands before you play because all the sweat and gunk and everything will eat away at this beautiful varnish that is on your instrument. So get yourself a microfiber cloth. Now you can just get these in the cleaning aisle of the supermarket, okay? It doesn't have to be anything fancy. In fact, I mean, this one's been with me for a very, very long time. It just gets, it does get washed, I promise. And then every time after you play, just give your strings a really good wipe down, but be gentle, particularly when you get to this area here. And we will talk about the bridge and everything in a second. But when it comes to cleaning the strings, particularly when you get near the bridge, just be really, really gentle. Literally just wipe it up and down, wipe all around the back where your hand's been, down the shoulders because we tend to sit and hold it like this. Wipe it down, wipe all over the back, and then, People always forget this bit, wipe the chin rest, particularly if you are a makeup wearer. This, this thing can get gross <laughs> really fast. So just make sure that you're wiping it all down, make sure that you've got all around here where your neck is, and just do that after every time you play and you'll find that your instrument stays nice and clean. However, don't use any extra cleaning agents on your instrument unless they are specific instrument cleaners. So for example, I have this little pot of varnish cleaner, which I just got from a website called String Zone. I'll link them below. They're an amazing resource for basically everything you need. And this was recommended to me by the luthier that I normally take my instrument to. Can't do at the moment. So he recommended this one because it's nice and gentle. You cannot use normal furniture polish on your instrument. I know it's wood. I know it's varnished wood. And I know that you can use your polish on varnished pieces of furniture and all that kind of stuff. It's not the same thing, okay? The varnish that they use on instruments is much, much more delicate, much more easily broken down. So please, please, please do not use polish on your instruments ever because you'll just strip the varnish off. Now, when it comes to the bow, very similar principles apply. Don't leave it anywhere too hot, don't leave it anywhere too cold, and always make sure that you give it a good wipe down after every time you've played it. This will still get some rosin on the stick and the underside of the stick. What I do is I literally just get same microfiber cloth and just pinch the stick between my first finger and my thumb, run it up and down a couple of times, job's done. Okay, so I wanted to show you this up close because I want to show you that all of the hair here is at the moment super loose, it's not tight. If I was to try and play with it like this, not a lot would happen to be quite honest, not a lot of sound would come out. So when it comes to tightening your bow, you want to be looking at this end here. So this is what we call the frog, and then you've got this little screw on the end here. Now, you've heard the phrase righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Exactly the same principle. So, as I twist this to the right, you'll see the bow hair starts to become slightly more taut. Now, one of the biggest mistakes people make with their bow is over-tightening. So, I'm going to try and come back a bit so you can see. It's got this kind of curve in it. And what we don't want to happen is for that to become too, like, I'm not actually gonna go too far because I don't wanna break my bow, but for that to become straight, okay? We want that slight curve. So a really good little marker for how tight to do your bow is how thick is the stick, basically. And tightening it up until that gap is just under the thickness of that stick. Now, the reason that I find this a really, really good little marker is because you don't need to have anything with you. Lots of people also say another good way of testing it is can you fit a pencil in between? Now, I can and it holds it perfectly fine, okay? So that's the other way that you can kind of test it, but obviously you need to have a pencil on hand. So this can just be a really, really useful, easy guide on how tight to do up your bow. When it comes to the end of your practice, the end of rehearsal, whatever it might be, make sure you loosen it back off and it's just righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Twist it round to the left until the bow hair is all nice and slack and kind of a bit flibbly. Don't undo your bow hair too much, however, because then the screw will come out, the frog will come away from the stick and that is not a problem you haven't broken your bow but then it does need to be put back together at which point I would say definitely ask your teacher's advice. 
Now, when it comes to how much rosin to put on the bow, that really depends on how much you are playing. So if you're doing about 10 or 15 minutes of practice a day, you're just starting out, you'll only need to rosin your bow once a week or so. The reason we don't want to rosin it more than that is that the hairs can actually become clogged with rosin quite easily and then you'll get quite a harsh scratchy sound which isn't really going to enamour you to play your instrument more so err on the side of caution when you first start out but then if you're finding that it's just kind of slipping and it's not making much sound then you do need a bit more rosin. However, if you're a bit more advanced and you're doing maybe at least an hour of practice a day, you do want to be rosining your bow pretty much every day. But again, use a little bit of intuition with this. If it's feeling slippy and it's feeling like it's not gripping, then you need a bit of rosin. If it's sounding quite harsh and scratchy, you've got too much on there. If you do put too much rosin on, don't worry about it too much, okay? It's quite easy to get the excess off. Simply tighten up your bow to its normal tightening and then on the back of your hand, just bounce it really really lightly or on the palm of your hand very gently we do not want to be whacking our bow on anything but that'll just mean that you see some clouds of rosin will fly off and that'll be just the excess kind of getting out of the way the last thing i want to say about the bow is that you never ever touch the hair with your fingertips any grease that gets on the hair of the bow will just impede its ability to make any sound at all let alone a good one so yeah never ever touch the bow never pick it up like this <laughs> never run your fingers along it to see what the rosin's like and especially down at the frog end here you can see there's a tiny there's a tiny bit on there i desperately need to get rehair so that may be why but can you see it's clean this should never be caked in gunk or grease or anything because then it's just simply not working and it'll actually just eat away at the hairs themselves so you'll find yourself needing to get a rehair a lot faster than you otherwise might need to okay so this is the bit that probably puts fear into the heart of most string players at the best of times let alone when you're first starting out and that is tuning your instrument now when you first start out your teacher will probably do it for you most of the time but they should kind of start to teach you how to tune your own pretty much from the very very off because as string players our instruments go out of tune all the time they can be super super temperamental mine is very temperamental particularly when it's cold she's like me she does not like being cold so you know maybe that's why we go on i don't know but especially at the moment lots of you probably can't get to your teacher and so you're having to do the tuning yourself at home now it's not as hard as we think it's not as terrifying as we think and there are a few things that you can kind of get or use that will make it so so much easier the first one of those is a tuner and you can get these super super cheap again I'll link a few below and this is something which will just very very clearly tell you whether your strings are in tune too sharp or too flat or if you have a piano you can tune it to the piano but I would say if you're starting out get yourself a tuner as it will allow you to develop your ear really quickly really really simply and it's just a really really great tool I still use it most days so when it comes to actually physically tuning your instrument, you have two options. You have either the fine tuners at this end, or you have the pegs at this end. Now, I will say, if you don't need to use the pegs, if your instrument is only a little bit out of tune, I would always go for the fine tuners, just because it's a little bit safer, you're less likely to break a string, and the pegs can just be a little bit temperamental. But, again, we'll get into that. So. When it comes to actually adjusting the pitch of your instrument, it's the same rule as with your bow. Righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Turning pegs or the fine tuners to the right will make it sharper, it'll go up, it'll get tighter if you like, and then turning them left will make it flatter. You'll probably find you get to the point where your fine tuners are all the way down to the bottom and you can't tighten them anymore. String instruments have a tendency to go more flat than they do sharp. At that point, Loosen off all of your fine tuners and that's when the pegs come in really, really handy. When it comes to actually using the pegs themselves, always make sure that you are applying a little bit of pressure into the peg box. So when I'm turning one, I will be pushing it slightly in and turn at the same time. This just means that you're not going to accidentally pull the peg out, the string unravels, and it all kind of goes everywhere. But if that does happen, don't worry about it. The pegs will have a little hole in them that you thread the string through and then just pop around there and then wind it up. 
you want to make sure that the winding, so the coloured bit, is on the inside and then the string is on the outside towards the edge of the peg box and then just wind it back up nice and gently. Be very careful not to over tighten however because that is when we get snapping of strings. If you're finding that you have trouble with your pegs not turning then the easiest thing to do is to gradually kind of wiggle it out as best you can and then grab yourself just an ordinary pencil and just shade in where the peg goes into the peg box a little bit and that'll just give you a little bit of slip. You can buy peg paste which it looks like this, it's normally in a tin, I lost my tin but you know here we are and it just kind of it's almost this sort of waxy texture and you can just rub that on the peg and that kind of does both jobs of giving it a little bit of grip but also meaning that you can turn it a little bit easier. So if you can get hold of some of this great but if you're in a pinch a pencil will work just fine. Now if you do find yourself in a position of having to change your strings yourself then it's super super easy but there is one big thing that you must remember. Do not change all of the strings at the same time. Do not take all four strings off because then this little guy will fall over. And the problem with that primarily is that you have a little post inside your instrument which I'm not going to be able to show you because you need to get a little camera inside but it's what we call the sound post and that is held in place by the pressure of the strings pushing through the bridge, pushing through the top of your instrument and holding it down. If that falls over you have to take it into your local violin shop and they will need to put it back up for you, you can't do that yourself. So yeah that's the number one rule. I recommend just changing the strings one a day and I normally take about a week to change over all my strings if I can. Obviously if I need to change them all in one go then I do and you know we just deal with it. But if you can do it over the space of a few days that's kind of the best. It just means that your instrument can get used to the new string and the new tension of it. Like I said these things are just uh, uh, always very very temperamental so make sure that you just take your time with it. Also if you do have fine tuners all across make sure that you're getting strings which have the ball end on them. Most do so that probably won't be a problem and if you're buying beginner strings then they definitely will but it just means that the little ball kind of hooks in to the fine tuner at the bottom here and holds it nice and snug which makes it much much easier to tighten up at this end. Make sure that you only do tiny movements at a time as well when you are tightening your strings. Like I said, they can snap and particularly with violins and particularly with the E string, it's like a cheese wire so you do not want that thing snapping and firing off at somebody or at you. Be really, really careful. And that's basically it. That is the kind of general all you need to know. The only thing that I do want to add on to that is that when it comes to putting your instrument away in its case, make sure that you take the shoulder rest off before you put it in. Just because otherwise, when you put the lid down on your instrument, it's going to crush the top of your instrument and I have seen people do this okay they close their case they've heard a crunch they've opened it up and this bridge is somewhere near the belly of the instrument so be really really careful when you're putting it away make sure you take that shoulder rest off and then the last thing is a little bit of a personal bugbear of mine but it is really important never store music inside the instrument on top of your instrument. You often see people doing it, they'll put their instrument away, they'll take the shoulder rest off, they'll wrap it in a nice little scarf, it's all good, and then they chuck a load of music on top of it and then shut the lid. Please do not do that. Same thing as with taking off the shoulder rest, you may well crush the bridge through the top of your instrument and that is basically irreparable. And we really, really don't want that. We want you to have your instrument for many, many years to come. I hope that was really really helpful. I know it wasn't particularly quick fire but I, I'm not very good at doing quick fire so to be honest I've given up trying at this point. And like I said I know that lots of you can't get to your teacher at the moment in order to help you with looking after your instrument. So please do take the time, it's worth the effort. These instruments can last for hundreds of years if we take care of them which is a really really amazing thing. So happy practicing enjoy taking care of the absolute gift that is your instrument and I will see you guys in my next video. Goodbye. I'm just generally being a little bit of a space... A space false hey false hey This is the only thing is that the camera is definitely going to decide that the viola is more interesting than my face. It's fair enough, I, I agree.